So this is the Intermediate McLaurin Olympiad paper from 2021. It's for these year groups here. Um, same as all uh, Olympiad papers uh, of this age group. It's, it's six questions, two hours long. So you've got a fair bit of time on each question. It's 10 marks each. All the working is marked. So you want to present your working properly. You get very few marks for just the answers. You want to prepare and present fully mathematical thinking and reasoning and so on. Um, I would suggest that you practice on the Cayley papers and the Hamilton papers uh, because they are very similar to this one, but maybe slightly easier. So they're good warm ups, um, if, even if you are in year 11, at least in England, and taking this one in particular. But anyway, let's get into it. So first question, just, I mean, in some ways it's very straightforward, isn't it? Because all we're being asked to do is solve these equations. Um, there's no sort of problem solving to do. When you get questions like this, it's really just a case of trying lots of things until you stumble on a thing that works. So what I decided to do was try to eliminate 2xy. So here I can write this as 4x plus x minus 2xy, because that of course makes 5x. And then this I can just replace with a 1. And then when I move the one over and divide everything by two, I get this. And this seems like a simpler thing to work with. And actually, it's, it's, it's fairly similar to this in the sense that if I doubled this and just put it here, which is there, I could then do this, take away this, and I'll end up with another fairly simple equation that actually looks a bit like this one, which is good. Um, and now I have maybe this to work with as well. And, um, and actually, this doesn't look like too much, but it's actually the key equation because because it equals zero um, and that doesn't sound like too much but actually what it means is that you can just factorize out a y here and say well now i've got two things multiplying to make zero so either this one is zero or this one is zero sorry uh, or this one is zero which means y equals 4x because y plus 4x equals zero means y equals minus 4x now of course if y is zero you can just go back to literally whichever equation you want to um, but this one's probably the easiest one and just say well therefore x squared equals one, so x is plus or minus one, and those are two solutions, zero, sorry, one zero or minus one zero in x, y pair. Um, or um, if this is the case, then you can put this back into here or into here, it doesn't really matter. I put it into here, just replacing the y with a minus four x, you get this, put them together, divide by nine, square root with a plus or minus, and then of course, you just say, well, if x is plus a third, um, let's put that into, again, any one of these is fine, but maybe um, this one is the easiest, I guess, just times it by minus four, and you get minus four thirds, or if x is minus a third, times it by minus, minus four for positive four thirds, and those would be your four pairs of solutions. Now, I actually missed this the first time I did it. Um, this, this nice little trick here allows you to do the question without too much work, but it is possible to do it without doing that. So, I mean, if you're happy with that, you can skip to question two at some point, but I, I might just show you the way that I did it originally, just because sometimes you don't spot the easiest way the first time you do it. Um, so what I decided to do was, it was very similar. I got to this point, like I did in the first, in the first thing, and then what I said was, okay, I can actually just complete the square on this, right? I can halve the thing in front of 2x here, which is actually 2y. So I'll halve that for a y, and then, of course, take away the square of y, which is minus y squared. Um, and that's fine. So that, that's just completing the square on this thing. I can rearrange that for x, though. So move the y squared over, square root with a plus or minus, remember, add y to both sides. And now I can take this expression for x, and I can just put it into here, which will just give me an expression when y. Um, so, okay, I need to square x first, so x squared is this. Um, you're going to have to expand some brackets properly when you do this. So it's going to be y squared first, plus y times this, plus another lot of y times this, or minus another lot, to either give you plus two lots of it or minus two lots of it, because the plus either happens twice or the minus happens twice. And then the last time will be this squared, which is, of course, just one plus y squared. So you eventually get all of this. Um, times everything through by two and collect terms and you'll eventually get to this. You can of course just move all of this bit to the other side um, and square everything. Now of course this makes the plus minus go away because if you square a positive you get a positive, if you square a negative you get a positive. So that just gets rid of that. This becomes 25 y to the 4. Um, for this to square you just square everything on its own. So 4 squared is this, this squared is this, this squared is that. Collect together, um, move across, uh, and now you can factorize out the y squared. And from here, you'll get the solutions that we had of y is zero, and then you find some x things. Or here, you can solve that for y is four thirds plus or minus, and, uh, and then you can get from x's from there. So again, even if you miss the, the easy way of doing it, there are other fun ways you could go about it. This completing the square trick is probably something you want to bear in mind and have in your head, because occasionally it is quite useful to dig you out of a problem um, on, on uh, just on occasion. Anyway, um, question number two. Um, so, 
these 12 points on this triangle are going to be joined together in such a way that it makes it look a bit like this. How many ways can that be done? So what we're going to do is we're going to start in the corners and say the corners are the most interesting because the corners can't connect to anything on their own two lines. So the corners can only connect to the three things opposite them. And super importantly, those three choices are completely independent of each other. As in, they, they whatever choice you make on one of them, so for example, if you go from here to here, that doesn't affect the number of choices that you've got on another. You can just go there to there or there to there. So, okay, 3 times 3 times 3 is 27 choices for linking up the diagonals. And now we consider this 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 one here we can consider, and, and that has how many things that it can go to? Or 1, 2, 3, or 4. So there are 4 choices for that one. Um, and again, you can just send it to whichever one you want. Um, and then you choose another dot. Let's choose this dot here. How many choices does that have? Well, it looks like it has three. One, two, and three. But it doesn't because it can't go here because then the last two dots are these and they can't connect to each other. You have to go through the triangle. So this only has two choices. Um, and when you use it, then you, you're just left with this. And so our choices are three times three times three times two times four. Now, that seems kind of simple when you do it like that, but it is quite possible to land yourself in trouble on this question just by not thinking it through properly. Um, and, uh, and it's because if you don't start in the corners, remember I mentioned I start in the corners because they were all independent of each other. If you start, say, here, and say on this dot there are six choices, right? One, two, three, four, five, or six, and just go to one of them. And then just pick another random dot like this one and say, well, how many choices are there here? Well, there's one, two, three, four, or five. Now, you can continue with this, but you already know this is going to give you a different answer because it contains different prime factors to this answer because you've already got five here, which didn't exist here. Um, and, and the issue here, so you can connect the other ones how you want and say, oh, two choices, two choices for these last two. Because uh, j just to explain how that happened, this one is forced because this can only now go here. So there's no choices there. That's forced. Then you have two choices for this corner, this one or this one, and two choices for that corner, this one or this one. And then you just connect whatever's left. Um, so that seems like it makes sense, but it can't be right because it doesn't make the same thing as this. And it's because you didn't start with independent choices. right? When we go all the way back to here, the fact that I went to this one meant that this one had five choices left. Whereas if I had gone, say, if I go forward, if I had gone to this one, then this would only have this would actually have one, two, three, four, five, six choices. Um, and so you need to pick things with independent choices to each other so they don't affect each other as you go along. So that's what was, was why we started in the corners, then went to the middles, then went to the sides, so that they wouldn't get in each other's way. So, okay, anyway, question number three. This question is um, the quickest question in the world if you know something, um, a little extra about maths. And if you don't, then it takes a bit longer. So what is that little extra something? Well, in GCSE, you learn lots of things, lots of circle theorems, right? But you don't learn generally, unless you uh, are super keen and, and, and have done some extra reading, you don't learn too much about the intersecting secant theorem. And what that theorem says is if you have two secants, which are basically just like lines or tangents that aren't tangents, they're lines that just go through the circles at two points. If you have two of those that intersect outside the circle, like over here, then there's the theorem that says m times n, so the distance from the intersection point to the first intersection with the circle, times that same distance all the way to the other intersection, so this distance times this one, is equal to the same thing on the other secant, so this distance times this one. That's the intersecting the secant theorem. Um, and, and that's going to be very helpful here. Just a quick note, though, is if your secant is actually a tangent, so therefore only has one intersection with the circle, well, this theorem still works. But you just use mr, in this case, twice. So this would be equal to mr times mr, because you're kind of just using the same distance two times, because you can imagine as, as this line gets closer and closer to being a tangent, mp and mq become closer and closer to being the same thing. And then when it is a tangent, they just are the same thing. Um, so that's, of course, mr squared. And what's even more interesting about this, this theorem here is you do learn this theorem. Um, in, uh, just ignore that for a second. You do learn this theorem in GCSE, where two tangents of the same length where they meet. And this is very similar to this. And actually, it's just a special case of this. All this theorem is, is this theorem, but the special case where the two secants are both tangents, and you have this distance times itself equals this distance times itself, so I'll just label it a bit like they did, mn squared times mp squared, 
But of course, because they're both positive numbers, we can just get that mn equals mp, which is the GCSE circle theorem. So this is definitely worth bearing in mind, and it does this question almost immediately if we just go back over here for now. Um, we can just say that um, if we focus in on the littler circle first, we've got ac, well that's a tangent, so it's going to be ac squared equals aq times ab. And then from the big circle, we've got ac times ap equals ab squared. Right, Q is not part of that bigger circle. And, and all you have to do is, is look at this and go, well, how can I make these the same? Well, just multiply them together. Just do this one times this one. The left is AC cubed times AP, and the right is AB cubed times AQ. And then just do a bit of division. Um, uh, divide this one over here and this one over here, and you end up with this. And that, of course, is just AB over AC or cubed, which is the answer. So yeah, if you knew this, this this theorem, it just wiped out this question almost immediately. If you didn't know the theorem, you essentially just had to derive the theorem on your own, which is also quite interesting. So let's just do it. So um, we've got a line. Let's draw a line in here. Um, I would, by the way, just recommend that you learn this. But anyway, let's, let's derive it. So we've got a line down here. Um, let's call this angle up here X. And... Um, this is a little bit of a difficult spot, but there's another GCSE circle theorem that's very useful here. You've got a tangent here, and then a circle, and then a triangle in the circle. So this circle theorem here, alternate segment, says that this angle is the same as this one down here. And likewise, if you draw another line here, you've got another tangent from a circle with another triangle in it. So this angle up there is also x. And if we just call this angle down here y, we're going to have lots of similar, similar triangles. We've obviously got ACQ, uh, which is within APB. Um, and those two triangles are definitely similar because of the x and y's in the same place. But we've also got this triangle ACB, um, which has angle y down here and x over here. So let's just rotate this a bit and I think reflect it as well until it looks the same as these two. It's in the same kind of orientation and get rid of that. And now we can derive this ourselves, I think. So it looks quite difficult to do so because we haven't got any corresponding lengths at all because we don't have any lengths in the, in, uh, given to us any, uh, at all ever. But look at the labels here. Um, we've got AC here, which I can label alpha, and also down here. We've got AB here and also AB here. So we've actually got some lengths that are the same, which is good. Um, let's look for a scale factor then. Let's go from here to here first. The scale factor is clearly beta over alpha, where you're going to over where you came from. Um, and so we can work out this length here, aq. Um, that's going to be something times this is that. It's going to be um, alpha squared over 2, because one of the alphas cancels, and then the betas both cancel when you get alpha. So that's that. And then what about from here to here? Well, the scale factor is clearly beta over alpha again, which is quite cool. So it's just the same factor again. And then we can work out this. Well, beta times this is just beta squared over alpha. And now the question is asking us to do AP, which is this one, beta squared over alpha, divided by AQ, which is this one. So it's going to do B squared over alpha, divided by alpha squared over beta. Um, if you don't know how to do fractions divided by fractions, um, you should probably learn how to. Um, this one goes right to the top, and this one comes down to the bottom. So we get beta cubed over alpha cubed. But beta is defined to be AP, sorry, AB, which is good, and alpha is defined to be AC, which is even better, and we get the answer as well. Good, halfway through it then, question number four, uh, a nice iteration question here. Um, let's just start doing it. So A1 equals K, which makes A2 equal K, which is A1, because we're using N is 1, plus 8 times 1. So this 2 makes an 8 times 1 here because this number is 1 bigger than that one. So the next one is going to be a3 equals all of this because it's the previous term plus 8 times um, 2 in this case because that's 1 less than 3 here. This number always being 1 bigger than that one. So the next one is going to be a4 which is going to be all of this again because you just used the previous term. All of this plus 8 times 3 which is 24 and so on. And we can kind of see a pattern here. And what I'm going to say is a to the n, or a n sub n, is k plus all of these multiples of 8, all the way up to the last multiple of 8, which is the previous n that you had before this one. So I could have just used n plus 1 here and n there, but I didn't think of that. So I'm just using this instead. And what I want to show is that this here, 
or, or no, what I want to do actually is 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 find a k such that this is always square. And you might have seen the first few of them and found a k in your head, right? Like, how do we make this a square number? Well, k is one will do. How do you make this a square number? Well, that's twenty four. So k is one will do because you'll make twenty five, and 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 so on. So k is one is and, and by the way, k is one of course makes that square as well. K, so k is one is is a good shout. Is it the only one we have to show this? Well, firstly, we have to show that it always works, but also we have to show that there might not be another one or whether there is another one. So let's deal with this a bit. Um, let's simplify it. So, of course, I can factorize an out, out an 8 from all of these terms to get 8 into 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on. And now this, if you don't know how to sum consecutive numbers from 1, please learn the formula. It's the last term times the thing above it divided by 2. So in this case, it will be n minus 1 times n all divided by 2. That will be the sum of all of these numbers. I'll link a video in the description below detailing that in case you didn't know. 8 divided by 2 is 4. Expand this out and we get this quadratic, which is cool. Now, essentially, I want this quadratic to be square all of the time. I want to find a k such that whatever n value I put into that quadratic, it's always square. So in other words, I want the quadratic to factorize into something squared. Now, when do quadratics factorize into something squared? Well, they only do it when they have an equal repeated root, right? That's the only time quadratics factorize to make a square. So I want this to have a repeated root, which of course means I want the discriminant b squared minus 4ac to equal zero. Now b is, uh, uh, and the reason I need to have a repeated root, of course, is because when you solve that for zero, you just get the same bracket twice, and so you get a repeated root. So that's why this is okay. Um, so b is minus 4, um, a is 4, k is, is c. Uh, that makes 16, of course, minus 16k, and of course k is 1 is the only solution to that. So k is 1 is actually the only solution, um, and that's that question. Um, oh, and by the way, the quadratic you get is, of course, this one. Oh no, it's actually got a minus there, hasn't it? Amazing. Ignore this line. It's completely wrong. Cool. Um, only one k is 1 is correct, though, but this is should have a minus there. Anyway, question number 5. We've got a triangular player crowd. Um, Side 7, 24, 25. Now, hopefully, as soon as anyone read that, you realize that that means you or you recognize that as a right angle triangle because it is one. Um, and now you're going to put some kind of lawn inside such that the distance from each point on the edge of the lawn to the nearest side is always two meters. So, okay, we can be two meters away from this side, right? Somewhere in here, right? And we'll always be two meters away. Now, we can't go too high because then suddenly we're very close to this side. So we're going to draw a perpendicular line to this side and stop when that perpendicular line, making a 90 degree angle there, is also 2. And then when we reach this point, we're going to start going down parallel to this side, always 2 away. And the same thing happens here. When you go down too far, such that the distance here is less than 2, you stop. So you want this distance to be exactly 2, and that's when you stop. Um, and then you just track straight back along to where you started there and do the same thing in this corner if you haven't already. Good, so that's going to be what the lawn looks like. Um, and it's essentially just asking us what's the area of this inside triangle. Now there are lots of ways to do this. I think the work solutions gave you three ways of doing it, none of which, well, I understood them, I just didn't have any idea how a human was supposed to come up with them. So I've got a different method that I think is much more human. Um, to do this. So what I said was, well, this angle is x, and so is this one, because again, these two sides are parallel, and obviously these two are as well. Um, and likewise, this is y, and this is y. So we've got two similar triangles here, clearly. Um, but we've also, I can draw some more similar triangles in here. Um, for example, if I go straight up from there, um, I've got a little triangle in here, and I can quite quickly work out that, um, well, this angle is 90, because this is perpendicular. Um, that's y, um, and so this is uh, 180 minus 90 minus y, which is 180 minus, uh, sorry, which is 90 minus y, which must be x because um, of this triangle here. So that one must be x. And also, much easier, um, this is corresponding to this. That's what I did the first time, call yeah. This is corresponding to this, of course. And then, of course, this is 90 degrees, so this one must be x. So this is similar as well. It's got, tri it's got angles 90, x, and y. So let's draw some of these out. So we've got this little triangle in here, base 2, angle x and y. Um, we've got this bigger triangle here, base 24, height 7, uh, hypotenuse 25, and clearly there's a scale factor of times 12. And so what times 12 is 7? Well, it's just 7 over 12, right? And this one times 12 is 25 is, 20, is 25 over 12, clearly. And this here is the hypotenuse, so that's this length here. 
that's 25 over 12. And then what I did, and you can see if you can figure out what I'm trying to do as I do this, but I went straight across from here and I wanted to work out this length. But of course this side length is also 2, this is 90 and this is x. So this is actually the same triangle as this is, just even smaller. In fact, no, it's just the same triangle because they're both base 2, right? It's just flipped over a little bit. So if I can work out this distance, which of course is this times 12 is 7, so that's 7 twelfths, um, then this distance is 7 twelfths. And what I'm going to do is say, well, okay, that means that the side of the, um, this is a, a lawn, this side of the lawn is 7 minus 2 minus 25 twelfths, which was this one, minus 7 twelfths, which is this one and I'll call that A. And I can work that out, it's a bit of fraction work, but you actually get this. And how is that helpful? Well, it's very helpful in, in lots of different ways. And, and you, there are lots of ways to answer the question from here. What I chose to do was, was finally consider this triangle um, and say it's 14 over six, and then look for a scale factor from here to here. Um, and the scale factor, seven times what is 14 over six? Um, well, it's 14 over six over seven, where you came from divided by where, sorry, where you're going to, divided by where it came from is always the rule there. It, it, a quick way of doing this is to say 14 is 7 times 2. 7 cancels with 7 and it just becomes 2 over 6 which is a third. And so the scale factor from the lawn to the playground is a third which means the area scale factor is a third squared which is a ninth. So now all I need to do is work out the area of the um, playground which is a half times 24 times 7. Um, which is 12, sorry, which is 7 times 12, which is 84, and then times that by a ninth, which is, of course, just 84 over 9, which simplifies, I think, to 28 over 3. And that's the, uh, that's the answer. Again, there are lots of ways, I guess, you could have done that. Um, but yeah, I think we've only got one question left, and it was quite an annoying question to do. It was actually quite fun on paper, but when you're trying to put it in PowerPoint, it was not at all. So you've got this kind of grids, um, m by n's grids, um, whether they're rectangular or square or whatever, and the cat starts at the top left and the mouse at the bottom right, and they move diagonally, and you're being asked which for which pairs, mm, is it possible for them to occupy the same square at the same time? Now, this is some extra stuff here. It says you must, for every single pair, m and n, you must either prove that it's impossible or explain there is a sequence of move that does it. Now, there's a few things that scream out to me here. Firstly, this stuff about how we have to logically prove it and show explicitly things that's fairly obvious it's worth 10 marks we can't just make stuff up and, and, and go with it we need to be clear but also it says for every pair n n now how are we going to do it they can be any whole numbers right bigger than one so we can't do it for every pair unless we group them somehow so as soon as i read this i was immediately thinking oh i'm going to need to group these by like odds evens evens odds kind of thing because otherwise i'm not going to be able to do them all obviously um so that was what i was thinking but anyway we can get rid of this now and actually try this to get a feel for the game, just try with some very small grids first. The 2x2 two two is the obvious one to go with. And now what it's saying is these can jump diagonally together at the same time, um, one cell. And so the cat can only go here and the mouse can only go there. Now, of course, they're in the cells that each other were in, but they're not in the same cell at the same time. And all they can do is swap places again, right? So they're never going to be in the same cell at the same time. So this is not, not going to work. They're just going to keep swapping. So that doesn't work at all. Um, the next biggest uh, grid is a 2 by 3 or a 3 by 2. It doesn't matter which you do. Um, but okay, now the cat moves diagonally, the mouse moves diagonally. And then, of course, the mouse could go back to where it came from. The cat could go back to where it came from, not making much progress that way. Or the cat mouse could go up there or the cat down there. But either way, what you notice is they have their own three cells, right? They never occupy... It's not like this, where they are in the same cells just at the wrong time. They're just in three completely different cells to each other all of the time. And so this is just never going to work ever at all. It's okay, the next biggest one up is three by three. And this one does actually work immediately. You just move them diagonally towards each other and they immediately go to come together and that one works. Um, so, okay, you could keep doing this a little bit longer if you wanted to. Um, I think I did, yeah, I did three by four. But again, three by four, you very quickly see the mouse occupies here, 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 and here. Those are its diagonals that it could possibly ever travel to. And the cat does the exact opposite ones. And so this doesn't work for the same reason this doesn't work. Um, so, okay, looking at these these low number examples, what, what feel can we have for this? Well, these two both failed for the same reason. And they're both 
evens times odd grids or odd times even grids, it's probably not going to make a difference because everything's going to be very symmetrical, isn't it? So I've got a feeling that even times odd grids just aren't going to work. And they're not going to work because the cats and the mouse just take up different squares on the grid. So this is the first case I'll try and get rid of. Um, so, okay, if, the, if it's an even times an odd grid, the cat starts at the top. If it's odd in, in terms of number of rows, then what's going to happen is the cat is going to take up obviously the top space where it starts and it's also going to occupy the very bottom space right um, because it's even because it's it starts on odd it starts on the first row and an odd row then goes to the third row and the fifth row and it will end on an odd row as well um, so there it is and then exactly the opposite going across if it's even it will occupy the first the third the fifth column but not the last even numbered column so it can never end up in the square that the mouse started in. And likewise, the mouse is, no, is if you do the logic backwards, never going to end up on the square that the cat is in. So the mouse and the, and the cat will just occupy different squares all the time. They'll have their own half of the board, if you like, just like these two. So this case just, just does never work. Right, you're just going to colour in two completely different sections of the board, one for the mouse, one for the cat, in this kind of grid cross-section-y style. And that's just not going to work. So, okay, we've got two more cases to consider then, and we can just as easily say if it doesn't work for odd r rows, even columns, it doesn't work for even rows, odd columns either. Um, it's just the same argument. So now we've got to deal with even by evens, like this case, or odd times odds, like this case. And again, dealing with these small examples gives us a good idea of what we think is going to happen. Um, but let's first, let, let's, let's first consider odd by odd, because I think it's going to work for odd by odd, and it's probably easier to just demonstrate a route that will always work than it is to prove that something will never work. So that's why I did odd by odd first. So okay, cat starts in the corner, mouse starts in this corner. Um, the way that I chose to do this was you just get the cat to run along the edge of the board, right? Only visiting the first and the second column, making its way down to the corner. So that's what the cat is doing. And you just get the mouse to do the same thing just along the bottom two rows of the board making his way over to this corner as well. Now, one of them is clearly going to get to this corner first, unless the two numbers are the same, in which case they just arrive here at the same time, which is fine. If they're not the same, though, one of them will arrive there first. Um, and let's just say that's the mouse, um, for, for sake of argument. And let's say the cat has got loads of distance. These squares aren't accurate. I'm just saying there might be tons of distance between here and here, where the cat's still going down. Um, now, how many more moves has the cat got to go before it gets into the corner? Well, it's got an even number of moves to go, right? Because it goes every even, every two moves, it gets back to the edge. So one, two, one, two, one, two. So to get into the bottom corner, it's going to have another even number of moves to go to get to the corner. So what can the mouse do in that time? Well, he can just bumble back and forth into these two into these two uh, into these two squares here, just waiting for the mouse to get to him. Um, and this will always work, right? The cat will keep making his way down, and the mouse will just bumble back and forth, and they'll both be on the first row at the uh, first column at the same time because they're always here after an even number of goes. And then, just as it ends, uh, as you imagine the end, they kind of go this way together, back again together, and then this way together, and they'll always finish on this square at exactly the right time. Um, so that's one way of getting them to meet at the same place, despite how many odd numbers you might have here. The, the um, work solutions actually gave an even cleaner solution, which is you just get the mouse to bumble straight away. Like he just bumbles back and forth his entire life and you just get the cat to go all the way down to the bomb and then all the way across to this bomb. And obviously they'll definitely meet. I think they'll actually meet here first as well, just like mine. But my solution is I think the quickest way to guarantee that they meet. Um, for any odd numbers, which I quite liked. So yeah, I went with it. So okay, we can always do odd times odd. And that's the quick little proof. Now now to prove that we can't do even times even. And remember what the issue with even times even was. It wasn't that they didn't occupy the same squares. They do occupy the same squares. They just can't do it at the same time. Like they get here and here, and then they just pass each other. And they occupy like they, they, they can all go to, both of them can go to these squares here. But they just can't do it at the same time. Sorry, they can't go to those squares there. They can go to these squares here, or like uh, they can also go to these two here or these two here. But they just can't do it at the same time. Um, so okay, how can we prove that they'll never be able to do it at the same time? Well, let's start them up here, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break the entire even by even board into two by two squares. And I can do this, of course, because if this number is even, then it's divisible by two. So I can always put two by twos this way to fit perfectly. And likewise for this one, so I can always fit in two by twos all the way along as much as I want. And now what happens is the cat starts in the top left of one of these two by two grids. And the mouse starts in the bottom right. And what happens is, after you make a move, the cat must go into the bottom right, and the mouse must go into the top left. But after another move, they actually go back. They, they don't have to go back to the original 2x2 two two top left, but they have to go to some top left of some 2x2 two two grid. They can't be in the bottom right, and they can't be in the bottom left or top right either. They have to be back in the top left or back in the bottom right, whichever one they, they initially started in, wherever they go. And so for any simultaneous second, one is always in the top right of one of these two by twos, and the other is always in the bottom left. All right, so they cannot occupy the same um, place at the same time. They can occupy the same two by two thing, but one of them will be here and one of them will be here, and it will just never work. They always alternate between top right, bottom left, and they're always in the wrong place at the wrong time. So that's one way to logically argue that that, doesn't, um, that, that, that won't quite work. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, I think that's the end of the uh, end of the questions there. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.